My name is Linda Pankowski, and I am a member of the Conservation Commission. And uh, I'm here to introduce Lauren. But before I do that, in the back of the room, there are these packets. Um, the Lemoyne Committee on Aging has organized them. And they include some material. The virus will stand up. So when you're walking, <laughs> she's modeling. And what a deal, only $5 to get one. So they'll be available at the end. Anyhow, um, I met Lauren in August in another project that um, we've been working on at the new Charles M. Sumner Learning Center. That's the new name. Excuse me. Um, in Sullivan. And in the center of the new school, there is an atrium, and there's going to be a pollinator in need of garden. And actually, Iris connected me to Lauren because Lauren volunteers for Frenchman Bay Conservancy. So everything is connected. So we're very happy to have Lauren come in, uh, speak to you folks about creating a pollinator garden. And if you don't mind my reading, she is an Ellsworth-based organic writer with a sustainability and gardening blog, and it's written up in, it's called ZeroWasteHomestead.com. And last night I looked on it, I welcome you all to do so. Lauren is a Maine Master Gardener volunteer. She assists with a number of local nonprofits, and she leads classes about pollinators and gardening throughout the state. So without further ado, Lauren Landers. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, so I'm Lauren Landers. I'm an organic gardening writer. I do this all the time, and my favorite thing, so I'm just putting my time around so I don't go over. My favorite thing to talk about is pollinators. Um, I talk about other things, uh, vegetable gardening and ornamental gardening, but I love pollinators because I just think they're so important. I write for my own website, Zero Waste Thomas said. I also write for a couple other websites like Bob Vila and Better Homes and Gardens. And so today I'm here to talk about pollinators and um, how to grow a pollinator garden and just how to help pollinators in general because they are imperiled. I think most of us know that. So before we get into the nitty gritty, um, also let me know if I'm going too fast or too quiet or whatever. Um, before we get into the nitty gritty of everything, okay, okay. Um, what is a pollinator? So a lot of people know that bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds are pollinators. Those are the most widely recognized ones, but there are lots of other pollinators. Pollinators can be mammals, they can be birds, they can be amphibians and reptiles, and of course insects. The main common thread that connects different pollinators is that they help plants reproduce. Usually they do this by moving pollen around while they're feeding on nectar and pollen in flowers, but there are also incidental pollinators that might be visiting flowers for other reasons. A lot of this, a lot of times that's because they're actually hunting, um, insects will be hunting on flowers, but these insects will also be pollinating flowers while they visit flowers. Um, there's also beneficial insects. So when we're talking about pollinators, I like to also throw beneficial insects into that group. Um, pollinators are a type of beneficial insects, but there are other beneficial insects that are beyond pollinators. A lot of beneficial insects are predatory insects that help keep gardens naturally pest free without pesticides. Something like a ground beetle, a ladybug, lacewing, um, parasitoid wasps are all predatory insects and technically beneficial insects. Um, there's also decomposer beneficial insects. Well, worms aren't really an insect, but they kind of fall into that category. They're helping clean up gardens and keep them tidy. And they're um, all categorized into this kind of beneficial group along with pollinators. And we're talking about them also because the, the factors that are influencing what's happening in pollinators is also affecting beneficial insects. Um, and beneficial insects are just great to have around if you want to grow an organic garden without pesticides. So like I said, most of us are aware of the big three pollinators, bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds, and also moths are, are in there. In Maine, we have a lot of bee pollinators that are natives, um, but honeybees are not one of those. Honeybees are actually native to Europe. Um, our native bees are bumblebees, mason bees, leafcutter bees, cuckoo bees, and sweat bees. 
A lot of our native bees are uh, solitary species. They don't live in hives. There are some exceptions to that. Um, bumblebees do live in groups, but they usually live under the ground. Um, butterflies and moths. In the state of Maine, we have native swallowtails, skipper, hair streaks, sulfur, checker spot butterflies, as well as monarchs, but they are migrational, so they're not here all the time. And hummingbirds, I didn't know this, but I, I knew about ruby-throated hummingbirds, but apparently there are other hummingbirds that are native to Maine. They're more rare. Um, Rufus, and then, I'm not gonna pronounce it right, Calio, <laughs> can't kill them. Yeah, but that's also native to Maine. Um, but beyond the big three, there are other lesser known pollinators that are equally important. And some of these pollinators are better at pollinating certain plants than bees are. Uh, flies, we have kind of an aversion to flies, but flies are excellent pollinators, particularly of certain plants. Um, hoverflies in particular, which this is a hoverfly, kind of looks like a little bee, but it is technically a fly. Midges and houseflies can also pollinate plants. And uh, beetles are a big pollinator. Um, fireflies are a soft body beetle and they are a pollinator. Uh, ladybugs are also pollinators, as are soldier be beetles, blister beetles, and scarab beetles. And then some of these insects that people don't like very much, they're actually pollinators too. So wasps are pollinators. They're usually incidental pollinators. They visit pollen fl flowers and kind of hunting for other things, but they end up pollinating plants. Um, ants can also be incidental pollinators. And interestingly, mosquitoes are pollinators. Um, only female mosquitoes bite and male mosquitoes are, they are uh, vegetarian and they only drink nectar and eat pollen. So why are pollinators important? Um, like I said, they are essential for the reproduction of many plants. There are some wind-pollinated plants, but pollinators pollinate about 75% of food crops or about one-third of the world's popular food supply. Um, so obviously they are um, inextricably linked with our own futures because of their influence on these food crops. They also pollinate wind, wildflowers and native plants that many other um, animals and insects depend on. And overall, pollinators are responsible for pollinating about 80% of the world's flowering plants. So the, all this pollinator activity does is it helps preserve the genetic diversity of plants, which is important for safeguarding our food supply. When we're looking at something like a monoculture, which is plants that are all the same, um, just a cornfield of all the same plants, they're vulnerable to the same pests and diseases. But if you have cross-pollination happening by pollinators, they help plants kind of evolve and w better cope with pests and diseases. So it's actually making plants more resilient to issues in the future, which has bearings on food security. Pollinators also pollinate native plants that animals depend on, so there's this whole food web happening. And the USDA valued the work of pollinators at around $18 billion annually, which I would argue that really can't be quantified what their value is, but $18 billion is significant. And then if you're keeping a backyard food garden, pollinators, inviting them into your garden can boost your crop yields. Uh, a lot of plants like squash and cucumbers won't fruit unless they are touched by pollinators. And I run some, um, I, I moderate some Facebook groups where people ask their questions about gardening. And one thing that comes up a lot is, why aren't my squash producing squash? And usually it's because they don't have any pollinators visiting their garden. So these people have to go out with a Q-tip and pollinate their flowers because there are no pollinators doing it for them. So you can grow more food crops if you have a pollinator friendly yard. So our future and the future of pollinators is inextricably in intertwined. Whatever happens to them happens to us because they have such a, a wide influence on so many things. Before we get into other things about pollinators, I just wanted to stop with a few fun facts that I learned while I was putting this presentation together. Um, beetles were one of the first pollinators. They evolved before bees. And actually some of the oldest flowering plants like magnolias and tulip trees are especially evolved to attract beetles. Um, beetles are the main pollinators of these plants still, so they have like different shaped flowers. Um, bees evolved out of predatory wasps about 120 million years ago. I wasn't sure which one was the chicken or the egg in that situation, but it was, it was wasp came first. Uh, a single bumblebee can visit 6,000 flowers in a single day. Um, if you compare bumblebees to honeybees, honeybees, they work faster, but bumblebees are fuzzier, so they end up moving more pollen around. So they're kind of comparable in what they can do. 
um, but they work differently. Honeybees, like I said, are not native to the US. They're actually from Europe, and most of our bees are solitary. And thanks to the beekeeping hobby, which is really catching on in a lot of places, there's actually more honeybees than there have ever been now. They're not imperiled in the way that our native bees are. And that, those are honeybees. We love honeybees anyway. <laughs> um, so what is happening to pollinators? There are various factors that are influencing what the pollinator decline, um, but the four big ones that come up again and again are climate change, uh, invasive plants and invasive species in general, the overuse of pesticides, habitat loss, and habitat fragmentation. About 40% of our pollinator species are at risk of extinction, including many butterflies and about one in four native bees. Um, climate change is, I think, the scariest one to talk about because it kind of feels like it's, it's a big problem and I don't know how to tackle that in my garden. But the way that this is affecting pollinators is that plants are now flowering kind of out of sync with the way that pollinators are um, pollinating. So this is particularly problematic for migrational, mi migratory pollinators like hummingbirds. They, hummingbirds will migrate based on day length, um, but they are now arriving in areas after the flowers that they depend on have bloomed because warming temperatures make the flowers bloom earlier. So they are sometimes without food supplies, which is why hummingbird feeders are becoming increasingly important. Um, invasive species is a big one. That one is easy, relatively easy to tackle, I think, in our own yards. Um, invasive plants kind of reshape e ecosystems and they outcompete native plants and change the food supply that's available for pollinators and they also just change the ecosystem in general. Um, I personally don't advocate for using herbicides on invasive plants. I like hand pulling and repeated cutting and using tarps to smother them out. Um, and invasive species, there are mites that are targeting bees and they can cause colony to collapse and that sort of thing. Um, and a lot of that is just moving products around, moving uh, plants around across state borders and that sort of thing. Pesticides is a big one, particularly in large scale industrial farming, but also to a smaller scale in home gardens. Uh, these pesticides, most of them, a lot of them, can't differentiate between pest insects and, pollinate, and pollinators, so they are um, taking out a lot of pollinators. And habitat loss and habitat fragmentation is a big one. And this one and the pesticide use in the invasive plant, I think it's all tackleable in our gardens. We can all kind of manage our own spaces. But habitat loss and habitat fragmentation, so that one is easy to picture on, on a larger scale with deforestation and urban sprawl. It's paving over wildflower fields and cutting down forests that these pollinators depend on. But also habitat fragmentation occurs when roads cut through habitats or fencing or buildings make it hard for bees to navigate. So like if a pollinator ends up in a cityscape, it's hard for them to move from space to space because there are no stopping spots of flowers to move around. So they're just kind of lost in this concrete jungle, which is why it's increasingly important to be growing like potted plants. Even if you don't have a large garden, just a few potted native plants can make all the difference for these pollinators as they move through spaces. And that's why pollinator gardens are so important. Um, pollinator gardens is one way to help pollinators. And I think it's a great way because it's really actionable and most of us can do it. Even if we don't have a lot of growing space, we can still do a little bit. And um, pollinator gardens of any size, just a window box or hanging basket can make a difference. But if you have the space for it, adding four essential things to your gardens really makes a difference. And that's food, water, shelter, and the safety for pollinators. So we're gonna go through all of those right now. Food is a big one. It's probably also the most fun one if you're into gardening um, because it's involved with growing plants. And the best plants to grow for pollinators are native plants. Native plants are the plants that are native to our local growing region and they have evolved side by side with native pollinators. So they are particularly well suited for the needs of our native pollinators. Um, they are also less demanding plants in general and they often don't need any supplemental water or fertilizer once they're established in gardens, so it's just a low maintenance, low maintenance way to garden. Um, native plants are four times more attractive to pollinators than non-native plants, just because pollinators are more likely to recognize them as a food source. That's according to the University of Maine. And if you're thinking about native plantings, you also wanna think about plants that are attractive to the adult pollinators as well as the baby pollinators. 
and those plants would be called the host plants because they host the eggs and the larval forms of these pollinators and help them grow up into pollinators. And that was a milkweed. These are chives. Beyond native plants, also nectar and pollen rich plants of other kinds are important for pollinators. Herbs are a great one. Uh, in my garden, I noticed that herbs are particularly, the insects really flock to them. Um, but there are other ornamental plants that can be grown for pollinators. For best results, you want to be looking for plants with different colored flowers and flower shapes because different pollinators are attracted to different flower shapes and flower colors. So for instance, a sunflower is really attractive to a butterfly because it's a large flat landing pad for them. Even large butterflies can feed on it. Whereas a cardinal flower or a foxglove is tubular in form and that's really attractive to the hummingbirds. You also want to be thinking about plants that are going to bloom at different times of the year to provide a little buffet for pollinators whenever they decide to visit your garden. And grow plants that uh, are not hybrids if you can. Hybrids are beautiful to look at, but a lot of times they've been so genetically manipulated that it's just hard for pollinate, pollinators to access the pollen and nectar inside. So I'm specifically thinking of like a zinnia. Um, there are some ball-shaped zinnias that have like double or triple blooms that it's just you really can't get to the pollen inside um, versus a, a normal heirloom zinnia has a wide flat flower that is easier for pollinators to access. Of course you can grow those but just maybe grow some some heirloom varieties too. Uh, so beyond plants there are other ways to feed pollinators and these are great options if you have a small space and you really don't have the ability to grow plants at the moment you can grow or you can install a hummingbird feeder or a butterfly feeder. Um, a lot of us know that hummingbird feeders are red because that color attracts hummingbirds. But you want to skip using a red dye in your hummingbird feeder. Uh, studies have found it's not great for hummingbirds and they don't really need it, especially if you're using a red hummingbird feeder. And I included a little recipe for hummingbird nectar. Um, I got it from the Audubon.org. It's essentially you just boil one part refined white sugar with four parts water and they emphasized refined white sugar is what you need to use, not honey. They said specifically not honey, that's not good for them. And you boil it and then you let it cool and then you don't need to use any red dye and you just fill up your hummingbird feeder. Uh, for a, a butterfly feeder, you can just get an old pie tin and cut up some fruit like apples, bananas, and oranges. And just display that in the pie pan, put the pie pan in a sunny spot and replace the food every day. And that attracts butterflies as well as other insects. And then just for hummingbird safety, it's recommended to clean your hummingbird feeder out at least twice a week. And I also have heard some horror stories about ants and hummingbird feeders. So I always recommend using an ant moat, which is like a little plastic cup that you can get on Amazon and it kind of installs above the hummingbird feeder and it makes it hard for ants to crawl onto the feeder. So that's food. And now um, before we move on to other things, main native plants for pollinators. So. Like I said, native plants are one of the best things you can do for pollinators, and Maine has a lot of excellent native plants that are both useful, useful for pollinators and also attractive for uh, gardens. And obviously a big one is milkweed. We hear a lot about milkweed. The state of Maine has four native milkweed varieties. Uh, we have common milkweed, poke milkweed, butterfly milkweed, and swamp milkweed. And monarchs use uh, milkweed as a the host plant for their young so they won't lay their eggs on anything other than milkweed and the caterpillars won't eat anything other than milkweed so if you want to help monarchs specifically uh, you want to see monarchs in your garden you need to grow some milkweed um, but other pollinators will also be attracted to milkweed beyond milkweed you want to think about like I said, plants that bloom at different times of the years. And a big one is spring ephemerals, which are, they're actually probably out about now. Um, I haven't, I, there's a patch of trout lilies that I keep an eye on. It's not quite out yet, but I, I know it's like probably in the next week it's gonna be out. Um, Bloodroot, trillium, and trout lilies are spring ephemerals in Maine that are natives. And spring ephemerals bloom before most other plants. So they provide an important food source for pollinators in early spring before other plants are flowering. This is helpful for pollinators as they're emerging from hibernation and also as pollinators are returning from migration. You also wanna think about fall bloomers, asters and goldenrod are big in Maine. Um, these provide food sources for pollinators before hibernation and migration. And we have assorted lots of asters and goldenrod varieties that are native to Maine, so you have lots to choose from. And 
Um, goldenrod gets a bad reputation. A lot of people associate it with seasonal allergies, but it's actually the similar looking ragweed that's responsible for most of those problems and goldenrod just kind of gets a bad reputation. It's actually a nice dye plant if you are into crafting and want to make fabric dye. Um, other main natives, I'm not going to go through all of these, but this is an obedient plant. Um, these are some other good ideas to plant if you want to grow some natives in your garden. I got this list from the Wild Seed Project, which is a good resource, and they have other native plants on there. Um, but viburnums is a good one that has autumn color. They are shrubs that have a lot of bright red leaves in fall, and then they also produce bright red berries in fall and winter, which birds love. Um, they're also host plants for a lot of pollinators. Hawthorns, buttonbush are great. Blueberries are great because they bloom early in the spring when other plants really aren't blooming. They produce these little white bell-shaped flowers that are particularly attractive to bumblebees. Um, we have low bush and high bush blueberries, depending on the size that you're looking for. Low bush can be used as a little ground cover. Uh, blue vervain, sweet ferns, pussy willow is a good one. It's a host plant for a lot of different pollinators. It also blooms earlier in the season than most other plants. It produces little pollen-rich catkins, which are a type of flower. Um, a lot of insects like that. Elderberries, foam flower, marsh, marigolds. Violets have an, a bad reputation in the gardening world. A lot of people think they're invasive. Um, but they are actually, they're native violets that are native to Maine and they are very helpful for pollinators. There's actually a couple of different insects that use them as their host plant. Um, one would be mining bees use violets as host plants. Um, and there's also a, a little tiny butterfly that uses violets as host plants. Uh, choke cherries, fragrant sumac, shooting star, red columbine. Dutchman's breeches is a cool one. Uh, it's related to bleeding hearts, so you can kind of see that it has weird little flowers. Um, they also call it corn salad because, or squirrel, squirrel corn. Squirrel corn because squirrels like eating it. <laughs> uh, sundial lupin. Um, so most of the lupins that we see in Maine are big leaf lupins, which are not native. Our native lupin is a sundial lupin, and it's been kind of outcompeted by these big leaf lupins. And so you pretty much only find sundial lupins in cultivated gardens. And um, there's one butterfly, it's a little, pretty little blue one, that only uses sundial lupins as its host plant. So if you want to help that little butterfly, grow some sundial lupins. Um, Boneset, blue iris, skullcap, joe pieweed, purple flowering raspberry, St. John's wort, wild bee balm. Cardinal flower is a good one for attracting hummingbirds, but also for rain gardens. It really tolerates soggy soil and it has these bright red flowers. It's very attractive plant, cut leaf coneflower, woodland sunflower blue, lobelia, ironweed, obedient plant, which this is obedient plant, and then mountain mint is another one I wanted to talk about because mint has a bad reputation as being an invasive, uh, aggressive plant, but we do have a native mint, it's mountain mint, um, it's a taller plant, it's about like, I don't know, three or four feet tall, it has silvery green leaves, it's, it's quite attractive, and it blooms late in the season, which is important for providing uh, food for pollinators before they're hyper. Uh, hibernation and it also is not as aggressive as other mint varieties and it can't be invasive because it's a native anyway um, a lot of these plants are growing in the Frenchman Bay Conservancy garden so if you have time this summer and you want to just go see a lot of our native plants in action they're there I know that they have mountain mint there so you can kind of check that out before planting it um, yeah. so beyond native plants there are other plants that pollinators really like um, Yarrow is actually a native plant. I should have put that on the other side. But this is a, the white plant is yarrow. That's a great one for butterflies because it has these broad, flat flowers that are easy landing pads for, for pollinators and, and bigger pollinators too. Um, you can buy pink and yellow yarrow, but studies have found that the wild white yarrow is actually more attractive to pollinators. Sunflowers, like I mentioned, butterflies really like sunflowers. Um, sunflowers are one that has been manipulate, manipulated a lot by the gardening trade for various purposes. So there are pollen-free sunflowers that are specifically used in the floristry trade and for bouquet making. Um, they still have nectar, but they don't have any pollen, so they are not as useful for pollinators. If you want to pick a sunflower that's great for pollinators, I would recommend the uh, mammoth gray stripe and lemon queen seem to attract a lot. And zinnias, this is the pink flowers of zinnia. Um, I mentioned that there are hybrid ones that are ball-shaped and that's hard for pollinators to access. But this one has a, a open flower face. You can see the pollen exposed. So, um, that one's a great one. It's also great for companion planting if you want to keep pests out of your garden naturally. Growing some zinnias in your garden beds can, can help keep pollinators, or can help keep 
pests out of your garden. Cosmos, Borage, Bachelor Buttons. Borage and Bachelor Buttons both produce edible flowers, so if you want some salad toppers, they're pretty cool. They're also useful for companion planting. Chives, fennel, parsley, cilantro, sage, caraway, and other flowering herbs. Just flowering herbs in general really attract pollinators, but you have to let them flower. And if you're working with a small space, just growing some herbs in pots or window boxes is a great option um, because they are just really small space friendly and just usable. And um, carrot, plants in the carrot family. So fennel and parsley and um, Queen Anne's lace fall into this category. They are really useful for pollinators, also really useful for companion planting, um, but you need to let them flower. Dill is another one too. Um, there are various pollinators, including swallowtail butterflies, that use them as host plants. So it's a great one to add to your garden. Beyond food, water is also important. So like I said, I recommend four things. This is number two for if you're building a pollinator habitat garden. Water, um, pollinators need it as much as we do, but bird baths can be a drowning hazard for smaller pollinators. Um, so I like to put pebbles in one side of my bird bath or a larger stone just in case anything falls in, they can scramble out. But there are other pollinator safe ways to provide water. You can put a solar powered bird bath fountain in your bird bath and it kind of shoots a little stream up and uh, flying pollinators like hummingbirds like to duck into that little water stream. Hummingbirds really like mister attachments on, on uh, hoses too. There's one, uh, it's like it's a stand that just sprays a little mist out and they just love that. A drip line system, which is, is a picture of a drip line system. I always advocate for drip line systems for vegetable gardens because they conserve water, but they also provide a gentle stream of water for pollinators. And they can also help you reduce weeds in your garden naturally. Um, and then you can also just run a hose left on trickle in a bare spot of your garden where the, the soil is exposed. This will create a natural butterfly puddling pool. Um, butterflies love flocking to moist earth. They get the nutrients, the salt and the nutrients out of the mud. So just making a little mud puddle for them can help. One of my favorite ways to provide water for pollinators is a bee pool. They're really easy to make. All you need is a terracotta saucer and some clean gravel or pebbles or glass marbles. You just fill the terracotta saucer with these little stones and then put some water in just below the stone line and then pollinators kind of, kind of scramble on there but they are not going to drown in something so shallow. You can position this in a sunny spot of your yard and just refresh the water daily for pollinator health. You can also put it near pollinator friendly flowers to just make a really nice setup for them. And if you want to make it especially attractive to butterflies, you can mix some organic compost or cut up fruit in there and then turn it into a butterfly puddling pool. So shelter is another one of the things I advocate for in a pollinator garden. And the best shelters for pollinators are native plants and native trees. Um, a lot of pollinators will hang out in hollow plant stems and old leaf litter. And they'll use these places to lay their eggs. Their larvae will grow up in there. They'll also weather out winter storms and hibernate in winter in native plants. Um, Bee hotels are also useful as are stack logs, compost piles, brush piles, plants with hollow stems, butterfly houses, and sanctuaries. Sanctuaries are otherwise known as dead trees. And I only recommend having one of these in your garden if it's in a spot where it's not going to pose a fall hazard on people or property. But these are little ecosystems in and in and of themselves, they often have woodpecker holes because the woodpeckers are feeding on insects inside, but there are also lots of insects that are just living there and raising their, or laying their young in there. So bees, butterflies, moths, woodpeckers, beetles, bats, and frogs will use snag trees. Snag trees are also excellent in improving the soil as they break down, um, but only have them if they're safe, not in a dangerous area. Native sheltering plants, a lot of these are the, the best ones are ones with hollow stems. So Joe Pieweed and Purple Flowering Raspberry both have hollow stems. Uh, Joe Pieweed is a good one for water gardens. And Purple Flowering Raspberry, I just think, is a pretty cool looking plant. <laughs> um, native evergreens are, are big. They're particularly big for fireflies who use the shade from the evergreens as a backdrop for their light display. Um, they can't find mates if there's too much outdoor light pollution, so that shade from these evergreens make it easier for them to signal to each other. They also lay their eggs down in the fallen uh, conifer needles underneath pine trees, and then the larval fireflies kind of 
live out their lives there until they turn into fireflies. So you want to see fireflies, native evergreens like spruce, fir, hemlock, and pine are great. More native plants that are great for shelters would be wild bergamot, also known as wild bee balm, has hollow stems, as does elderberry and button bush. I, I just love button bush because it has funky little circular flowers. It's just it's odd, um, but it's a host plant for 27 different species of uh, butterflies and moths, and it also grows in water gardens. So if you have a soggy part of your yard and you don't know what to grow in it, a, butter, a button bush, it's also really low maintenance. It's just a cool plant. And then, like I said, milkweed is just really important for all pollinators. They all love their flowers. Um, particularly, it's important for monarch butterflies, which this is a monarch caterpillar. Um, Maine has four native milkweeds, and I also have seeds at the door. I recommend you grab them. They are the common milkweeds, and I can answer questions about planting them. But so Maine has poke, common butterfly, and swamp milkweed that are all native. Swamp milkweed is a good one if you have a soggy garden or want to create a rain garden. Butterfly weed is just really showy; it has orange flowers. Common milkweed is a spreader. Um, so you, you want to be careful where you place it because it will just kind of take over. Um, but I, I like it anyway. And I couldn't get a picture of poke milkweed, but it looks a lot like the common and the swamp milkweed, but it has paler flowers, and the, the flowers are a little bit more sparse, and they kind of droop down a little bit. But it's still a pretty plant. And if you're planting native milkweeds for butterflies specifically, you want to put them in an area that's not particularly windy because some of these butterflies are not strong flyers, and you also want to not put it near bird feeders because the birds will pick off the caterpillars. Uh, so other things other than plants for shelters is a bee hotel. So I picked this picture because it shows a bunch of different bee hotel options kind of all at once. So you can buy a pre-made bee hotel or you can make your own. So this picture shows um, there's some untreated wood that they have bored holes into. They've also stacked some sticks in one end, some pine cones, some little cardboard tubes which you can buy on Amazon. Um, and you can create your own or um, I really like one on Amazon. It has the cardboard tubes that are replaceable because you want to be cleaning out a, a bee hotel about once every one to two years because mice and stuff like that can accumulate in it. So when you're picking a bee hotel or making one, you want either one that you can compost later on or clean easily. Um, and the cardboard tubes are, make it easier to clean. When you're thinking about a bee hotel, you also want an overhang because you want to keep them dry. So it's kind of clipped off in this picture, but there is a roof over this one. There's also, you can see some hardware cloth in the front. Um, this keeps woodpeckers from eating some of the hibernating bees. So uh, bee hotels are particularly important for solitary bees. Most of our native bees are solitary, so they will make use of this, but other insects will make use of this too. Garden cleanup is, is one that comes up a lot in the gardening world, so people are always really antsy about cleaning up their gardens in fall, but it's better to wait until spring if you can because a lot of pollinators and other insects will be hibernating in the leaf litter, and if you clean up your garden in fall, they won't have any place to hibernate. Um, so the best time to clean up your garden is in spring when the temperatures are consistently above 50 degrees Fahrenheit. At this point, the pollinators are kind of woken up and they've started flying around. Um, but I do recommend cleaning up any diseased or um, pest infested plants in fall, so you don't have pests overwintering. So the final element of a pollinator garden is safety. So if you're inviting pollinators to your garden, you also want to make sure it's a safe place for them. And one of the big ways to do that is to keep uh, chemicals out of your garden whenever possible. Um, these pesticides don't discriminate between beneficial insects and pest insects and it can just cause a lot of problems. But there are other ways to deal with pests other than pesticides. Does anyone know what this, what this is a disease, a plant disease? Oh, yeah, that's a big one. So that's one that you want to clean up in fall if you have infected plants. You clean up these damaged plants in fall and it keeps these problems from overwintering. And that's a great way to get on top of pests and diseases. It's just doing a really targeted garden cleanup and destroying infected plant matter. Um, you don't want to, compost a lot of these unless you're getting your compost pile really hot um, because a lot of these diseases and pests can survive the composting process. So if you have something that's infected like this, you want to either burn it or bag and trash it. And um, there are some plants that you shouldn't burn. I mean, I'm thinking poison ivy. We, I recommend just kind of Googling before you start burning plants just, just in case there's something that you shouldn't be burning. Um, but cleaning up your garden in fall is a good way to keep your garden organically pest-free. 
Barrier methods are also really handy. So this is a fruit protection bag. Um, this keeps various insects from eating, like your tomatoes. It also helps keep birds off things. And grapes, this is a, a grape. Um, floating row covers are also really great for keeping pests off plants organically. For best results with those, you want to install them early in the season, as early as possible, basically when you're planting your plants outside. Um, I personally don't grow brassicas, so uh, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, without floating row covers, because just the cabbage loopers are intense, but these keep, uh, they, they keep your plants protected without any kind of pesticides. And barrier methods, particularly row covers, work particularly well if they are combined with crop rotation, which I'll talk about in a second. So companion planting is a big one. I love talking about companion planting because I just think it's really fun. And it also is just, I think it makes your vegetable garden look more pretty, but it's also uh, a great way to control pests. So this is marigolds planted with some, I think some Swiss chard or beets. And um, so this companion planting is when you plant two or more plants that are mutually beneficial to each other side by side. And this can help various in various ways. Um, the right companion plant can enrich the soil and make other plants grow better. So something like a bean or a pea adds nitrogen to the soil and it can help plants, it fertilizes its neighbor and helps plants grow better. Um, there are other plants that can be used for shade. So a lot of times people will pair tomatoes with basil because the taller tomato plant casts shade on the basil plant and helps prevent the basil plant from getting sunburned in hot summers. But the main reason people use companion planting is for pest control. That's an old technique. And there are various plants. You can find a lot of information about plant pairings online. Um, but some of the big ones that are used a lot are marigolds, nasturtiums, um, zinnias, flowering plants that can be just tucked in your vegetable beds. Plants in the carrot family, like I mentioned, are really good. So dill, parsley, and fennel. Well, fennel, you don't really want to grow with other plants because it, it can kills its neighbors. But you can put it in a pot nearby. Um, but to get the results out of those, you want to let them flower. Um, yarrow is a good one, borage, daikon radishes, and alliums, onions, garlic, and chives. Um, borage and daikon radishes have been recommended for tomato hornworms in particular. Um, and the plants in the carrot family are really useful for cabbage loopers. They actually attract predatory wasps that will prey on the cabbage loopers and keep your garden pest free. And then another type of companion planting is trap cropping, which is basically you're growing a sacrificial plant near the plants that you actually want, and the pest will usually go to that plant and leave the plants that you want away. So a good example of that would be Hubbard squash. Hubbard squash are generally more attractive to squash vine borers than other squash that we like to eat. So if you just put your little sacrificial Hubbard squash on the side, you can kind of keep your squash protected. Other methods for organically controlling pests include hand picking pests into a bucket of soapy water. Um, this works well for big pests like tomato hornworms. Um, they're kind of hard to spot, so I recommend using a black light at night and they kind of light up like they're on their neon lights. Um, soil solarization is good for soil dwelling pests. It also can kill off certain diseases in your garden. So for that one, you're gonna be laying clear plastic sheeting over your garden bed in summer. When it's hot, you leave that in place for about a month and it basically cooks everything that's in the soil. That works well with um, the barrier method, the, the row covers, because you can then cover up the soil later on and make sure that these insects don't get in there again. That's good for squash vine borers is an example of that, but also certain grubs can be handled with soil solarization. Rotating crops on a three to five year cycle works to reduce pest problems too because a lot of these pests are hanging out in the soil and then they just keep re-emerging over and over. But if you're moving the plants that they like to a different part of their garden, they're harder to find. And especially if you then cover the plants up with floating row covers, these insects can't emerge and then be a problem year after year. So that means not planting like tomatoes in the same spot for at least three years. Attracting natural predators is another one. Um, I already mentioned companion planting for beneficial insects, but you can also install bird houses and, and uh, bird feeders to attract birds who will take care of some of the insects. Or you can use deterrent sprays. I've heard mixed results on these. I personally use garlic oil. I think it works for me. Uh, some people say it doesn't. Um, I haven't tried cayenne spray myself, but I've heard that it works on caterpillars. And um, but these need to be reapplied regularly and particularly after rain to remain effective. 
And then if you are going to be using pesticides, I recommend choosing the safest option, uh, organic pesticides, and knowing how to apply them properly, which means not spraying plants in flower and just doing really targeted applications and avoiding anything that works systemically on plants, which systemic pesticides travel through the entire plant and affects the flowers, the seeds, the roots, every part of the plant, um, instead of just the leaf that you spray it on. Um, so what I personally use the most would be a uh, organic insecticidal soap spray that I just make out of Castile soap and water. Um, I also occasionally will use neem oil, but that is, it has the potential to be systemic. Um, diatomaceous earth is one that comes up a lot, but you want to just make sure that's not anywhere that it will come in contact with pollinators because it will affect pollinators um, as well as pest insects, but it is, it is or approved for organic gardens. And the only thing that I've found that works for scale insects, which are my nemesis, is uh, organic horticultural oil um, has worked on hard-bodied hard scale. Um, but you have to be diligent with that. Um, and then I, I think one of the best things to do is just accepting a little imperfection with your garden. So um, it is a great way to help pollinators just be like, okay, there might be a few holes in my plant leaf, but it also is going to be reducing stress for you because you don't have to worry about your plants not looking perfect all the time. So that's building a pollinator habitat garden. But there are other ways to help pollinators. Um, one way is to turn off your lights after dark, put your outdoor lights on timers, and using blackout curtains. A lot of nocturnal pollinators are affected by light pollution, so that would be moths and fireflies. Um, Controlling invasive plants, like I said, invasive plants outcompete with native plants and reshape ecosystems. So pulling out invasive plants when you see them. Um, Japanese knotweed is a big one. Uh, Oriental bittersweet is another one that comes up a lot. Um, shopping locally helps small farmers and, and local businesses, but it also reduces transportation, transportation and fuel waste and it helps combat climate change. Um, choosing organic produce because you are voting with your dollar to not have these products being sprayed around. Uh, spreading the word, I think a lot of you are doing this tonight by being here, but getting your garden certified and attending pollinator events like this one, making wildflower seed balls uh, with milkweed. Uh, one thing about that is that it is illegal to throw those in some areas, so you do want to check local regulations before throwing wildflower seed balls around. Uh, hosting a garden party because it might inspire somebody else to grow their own pollinator garden if they see how cool yours is. Uh, attending eco or attending native plant swaps. So I know that they, um, Native Gardens of Blue Hill has a native plant swap. They, well, they, they, I, I don't think they've announced it yet, but they had one last year in spring and fall. So that's a good place to get native plants. And supporting eco-minded businesses and joining an online community can all help pollinators. Communities as a whole can do a lot of things to help pollinators. I mean, signing the Mayor's Monarch, Monarch Pledge is a great one. Um, yeah, yeah. Hosting pollinator-friendly events, um, supporting eco-minded businesses and farms, creating a community garden, spreading the word, reducing sprays, reducing nighttime light pollution, invasive plant management, just growing more green spaces, planting native plants and pollinator friendly plant flowers. So next steps for us, um, if you wanted to do something tonight, um, you can get your garden certified. The website National Wildlife Federation will certify your garden. You can get a little sign and stick it out in your yard. Um, the Cooperative Extension Office through Maine and the, um, the Hancock County one is in Ellsworth. They will also certify your garden as a pollinator habitat. Um, you can get on the Homegrown National Park map and they will put like a little pin where you are and it, it helps support the Homegrown National Park in their work, um, but it also just helps you get involved with the community. And the Homegrown National Park, I actually, uh, I run the Facebook page for the main friends of Homegrown National Park, so I recommend if you like this, uh, come join us and we talk about pollinator events. Um, but there are ideas that if everyone planted just a few native plants or just a few pollinator friendly plants, the collective effect of all of us doing that would be greater than all of the national parks combined. Uh, attending a native plant swap and joining an online community and then planting some native milkweed seeds which I have offered at the door so I recommend you grab. I have plenty of them. So. And then resources that I recommend a lot. So this is Nat National Wildlife Federation is where you get certified. Um, Homegrown National Park is where you get on the map. And um, I also have a couple flyers about Homegrown National Park at the door. Um, Friends of Homegrown National Park, Maine is the group that I run on Facebook, and you can join that. 
Um, Prairie Moon Nursery, Strictly Medicinal Seeds, and um, Native Gardens of Blue Hill and Wild Seed Project are all great places to source native plants. Um, Native Gardens of Blue Hill has the swap. The other ones specialize in selling seeds. Um, Native Gardens of Blue Hill and Wild Seed Project also have really great information that you can find out more about native plants and find planting lists and that sort of thing. Xerxes Society and Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center also have a lot of great information about pollinators and native plants. Um, Trenton Butterfly Garden, I also volunteer with them. And they are, they, Trenton has signed the Mayor's Monarch Pledge as well, and they host a bunch of pollinator events. So there is a butterfly festival coming up, but they also are on Facebook if you want to join that group. And then the Humane Cooperative Extension Office for more gardening information and getting your garden certified. And then this is me. I run Zero Waste Homestead. And um, if you want to learn more about this, I'm always writing about pollinators and gardening. So check out my blog. I'm also on Facebook. Uh, Twitter, aka X, and uh, Instagram. And just thank you for coming out. So I, I had a little quote. It's, uh, many eyes go through the meadow, but few see the flowers in it by Ralph Waldo Emerson. And I think today we've kind of seen the flowers in the meadow by looking and appreciating uh, little pollinators. So thank you so much. And I'm ready for questions. Most of them should have moved on by then. Um, I think the best option would be to put them in a cold composting pile or a brush pile and just kind of let it rest a little bit longer, um, not put it in a leaf chipper just in case. But I think if you wait until it's consistently warm out, most of them will have moved on. So if you do need to like leaf ship it or put it in a hot compost pile, the damage would be kind of minimal. Any other questions? Yes, I did. <laughs> it's a good one. Yeah, and the taste of the, uh, the fresh ginger is totally different. It has soft skins and stuff. It's not woody like the stuff we get at the grocery store. It's just like it's a different experience. But, yeah. Any other questions? I'll be hanging around, so if you want to talk to me about plants. <laughs> On behalf of the Conservation Commission, we wanted to give you a little thank you gift for coming out and sharing your expertise, the official Le Moyne uh, Conservation Commission mug. Um, thank you so much uh, thank for, you so much. for coming so uh, with, uh, to share with us, uh, yeah. Lauren. And um, as long as I have your undivided attention, and since uh, Lauren um, brought up uh, some of the great things that you can do uh, to support uh, monarch butterflies, uh, and this being the second year of our involvement in Mayor's Monarch Pledge, um, the Conservation Commission is um, uh, going to be offering seedlings um, for a very nominal sale price at some point later in the summer. So. Um, keep tabs on uh, happenings around town. I'm not sure exactly when we'll have them available, but, but uh, hopefully we'll have uh, both uh, two kinds of butterfly weed, swamp milkweed, and uh, common milkweed as well. So, and uh, yeah, I encourage you to pick up some seeds on the way out too. Well, thank you so thank much. You, yeah. Thank you.